Hello, I'm glad you're with us this evening, whether it be in the building or whether it be online. Been looking forward to this evening for quite a while. I've got notes all over the place, so I've just about got myself settled here. And again, we appreciate you being here and sharing some thoughts from God's Word with us this evening. I was so thankful that Christmas morning when I was a child. And my sister and I got up and ran to that tree. And underneath that tree was a Bible. A Bible I could call my own. I knew it was mine because it's the first Bible I had with my name in Boston, the lower right hand corner of the cover. What a thrill. I was just so excited. I was going to read it from cover to cover. My sister got one too. She's 22 months older than I am. She's probably listening. Uh, so I got to rub that in a little bit. But she was a little faster reader than me. But that's okay. It wasn't a competition. I was so determined that I was going to read that Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And I read on and on. I ran about, read about that creation. I ran about, read about that first sin. And I read about the consequences. No more beautiful garden. I continued reading all the stories I had learned in Bible class. And I remember well having seen them uh, when I watched the movie, The Ten Commandments. Now, uh, that plays on TV every now and then, but I always thought that was such uh, a well-done movie, and it made an impact on a little boy. I read all those accounts, and I thought, man, I'm doing good. Got to the book of Leviticus, and I said, you know, I think I need to go out and sharpen up my basketball skills. That was a rather weak point in a child's life. I guess it's the first lesson I learned uh, spiritually about trying to have it my way instead of the Father's. But I've had the privilege over the last 10 years or so to uh, teach in a rotation upstairs uh, on Sunday morning, a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Old Testament. Started about 12 years ago, the class did. Uh, Butch started the class. I, I went in there after a couple of years, thought I'd give it a shot and end up in a teaching rotation. What a blessing. What a blessing it was to be in a rotation with Richard Egerton, Dwight Burton, two great men who made a big impact on this congregation. But studying the Old Testament that way, verse by verse, is, seems kind of difficult, and we've got a good group of people. When the pandemic stopped us in March, we were at uh, Psalms 91, nearly halfway through in 12 years. It will only take us 25 years to study the Bible through verse by verse. But I said all that in the beginning just to say this. Sometimes we shy away from studying the Old Testament. We think it's too hard or too long or too tough. But we miss a lot of blessings. And it was mentioned earlier about finding out the nature of God. And we find out the nature of man, too. And as Danny read, we are a stiff-necked people. They were then, and we are now. Uh, what did I do on my mask? Folks today are crying about a mask. Stiff-necked. Um, but uh, we, uh, we like to grumble and mumble and grieve sometimes when we shouldn't. 
Let's get to, to Numbers chapter 13. I had Danny read that verse because I wanted you to be well aware before we got to it later. That Moses went before God to try to calm his anger with the people. And that occurred at Sinai. And uh, tonight's lesson is pivotal in the history of the Israelites. And uh, Michael Woodring's going to continue uh, some thoughts next week in the next two chapters, and uh, we're going to talk about failure. We're going to talk about probably one of the worst moments in the history of Israel this morning. Lineage and history were important in the culture of the Old Testament people that had been handed down through their forefathers. It had been handed down by patriarchs. And in writings, their heritage was important. So this stiff-necked group of people that we study about tonight knew every bit of the Bible accounts that I read when I was a child. And we've studied. They knew it all. But from a personal standpoint, when you stop and think about it, the only thing these people knew was bondage. 400 plus years, you have to imagine, they were born in bondage. And that's all they knew. But in truth, they saw the power of God in those plagues. They saw the power of God and heard the crying and the wailing. That night they were passed over because the blood of the lamb was on their doorpost. They left Egypt with joy. And again, they saw the power of God at the Red Sea. They saw the fire block the Egyptian army they got across that sea safely and they saw the waters cover and destroy the Egyptian army. They lived through all that and yet while the smoke was rolling and the ground was rumbling when Moses was on Sinai, they were at the bottom of the mountain sinning in all kinds of ways and building a golden calf. Just as Danny read to you. Reading and following directions is not one of man's better attributes. We tend to want to do things our way. In the fall of, night, well, actually it was a winter of 1972, I found myself someplace I didn't particularly want to be. I had received a letter some months before from Richard Nixon, and it began greetings. And I was at Fort Knox, Kentucky in January of 1972. And I remember this vividly. We were at a range where we were learning how to handle hand grenades. Now, I don't know how many of you had the pleasure of having a hand grenade in your hand, but this was going to be an experience. I uh, listened as the training officer there at the range said, I'm gonna have you walk up to the wall individually, pull the pin and hold the hand grenade until I tell you to lob it into that pile of tires over there. So it came my turn. And I probably was shaking and I pulled that pin and held that hand grenade at my side. And it seemed like forever. I thought to myself, I got to lob this. I've got to do it right. And he said, okay, you can, you can let her rip. And I threw one of the best fastballs I've ever thrown. I was ready to get rid of it. 
It didn't matter what they said and how to do it. I just wanted to get rid of it. Well, there's a problem with that. A hand grenade is on a time fuse, and if the enemy would have got it, they could have threw it right back at me before it went off, and I could have been killed with my own weapon. Failure. In real war, that would have gotten me in a bad situation. So Israel is still at Kadesh Barnea, the same place they were last week uh, when Stephen gave his lesson. And by the way, if you haven't seen that lesson, it's very apropos to this time. And I suggest you go back on YouTube and take a look at it. Um, you'll be benefited greatly by it. With that great multitude of people, uh, somewhere guessing three to five, five million rather people, you can imagine that the devil was active and he's and and all these folks are about to be in conflict with the holy will of God. That occurs quite often, as I said earlier in the Old Testament, and is still occurring today. The wise man Solomon said through inspiration, or he wrote through inspiration in Proverbs 14 12, there is a way that seems right to man but its end is the way of death. In Proverbs 16, 25, the wise man Solomon writes, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And you say, well, George, you copied that down wrong. Uh, that's the same scripture. No, it's, it's copied down right. But isn't it interesting uh, that uh, you, you don't think, I don't think Solomon forgot that he had written that through inspiration. I think it's there to stress the point. The point that is the problem and the focus of the lesson tonight. God's way is the right way. Man's way will get you in trouble. So like we said, the time is here. It's time for the people to go into the promised land. Numbers 13, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men out to spy the land of Israel from each tribe of their fathers, and you shall send a man, every one, a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Parah, according to the command of the Lord, all of them men, who were heads of the children of Israel. And it proceeds to give their names. In verse 1, it plainly says that God is giving him the land. It seems the people were reluctant. So God spoke to Moses. In verse 2, and said, send them that they might see it for their self. That's interesting. It had been prophesied, and they had known about the commitment that God made to Abraham. Yet they had to see it for their self. And they were told to go out and see if it was a land of people who are weak or strong, few, few or many, and if the land is good or bad. But if you look back at Scripture, God has told them the answer to those questions before. But they had to see it themselves. These men were gone 40 days. They were all throughout the promised land. I wonder if one of them was at Hebron where Abraham got that promise. wonder if one was at Moriah and Calvary, near that area that was going to be so, so much in the future of man. 
and they were basically, uh, from all indications, all over that land. And they came back to make a report. And they said, the people who live there are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. The word fortified indicates that the cities are inaccessible. The cities are described as beyond their reach. Further, the descendants are of Anak, and they're known to be warriors. Not only this, there are many enemies in the land. The Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and the Lucites who were painters. I, I said that last one just to see if you were paying attention. Uh, there were no Lucites there. But when that was said, it seems that the people were kind of disturbed about that. Look at verse 30. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. He had to quiet the people. Why would that be? The Amalekites were descendants of Esau, and they were considered the enemy. The Hittites were descendants of Ham, one of Noah's sons. And they knew well the history that Ham had. Now let's consider what just happened. Caleb said, let's go. The others said, no, they're, they're, they're too big. There, we we just can't we just can't do it. Twelve men saw the same thing, the same enemies, the same fruit of the land, and it's got to make you shake your head. The ten forgot how this began. God promised to give them that land. God said, "I'm giving you the land." God did not tell them to look at the land and see if they were strong enough to take the land because the answer to that question was they weren't. It was going to be accomplished with God's help. Rather, they were uh, to see the land God was giving them, but they forgot what God was giving them. So the challenge is laid before the people. Will you walk by faith in the promises of God or walk by sight? Will you decide what you see? Will you decide by trusting in the word of the Lord? So let's look uh, uh, quickly at chapter 14. We're we'll doing a little bit more reading here. Then all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? I read that and I thought, well, how would, how would that go? Let's, let's go back to Egypt and say, Pharaoh, uh, sorry, sorry, buddy. Uh, sorry about your son and, and all those plagues and sorry that so many of the people here lost their life and 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 Pharaoh your army we're, we're sorry about that too would you just take us back I don't believe I would want to be the person standing before Pharaoh to do that but 
How in the world could they come up with that kind of a response? They were rejecting Moses and Caleb. They were rejecting God. How could they expect, after having already made God mad at Sinai, that God wouldn't be mad at them now? They were even threatening uh, to stone Moses and Aaron and Caleb to kill them. They were grumbling. Why didn't we die in the desert? The same argument they used at the Red Sea. The stiff-necked people were grumbling. And as you can imagine, God was angry. Our only conclusion could be, at least mine was, is that their faith was so weak and their fear of confronting the enemy was so strong. But how could they think that this was right? Understanding the severity of the re rejection, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the whole assembly. Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes in outrage and mourning. Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who said, we can do this. This is a good land. Let's take it. God will bless us. Their, their protection is removed. God's going to give us the land. It's a very compelling argument. God is with us and he will give us the land. After all, that's what he told them in the beginning. Look at verse 10. All the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel. Wow. Can you visualize that? They're in an uproar. They're going to they're gonna stone these two men who had devoted so much to them as well as God. And they didn't expect God to show up, but he did in the form of that cloud that he had been leading them, leading them with. And it's amazing what, what we read here. I, I think, uh, if I think back to uh, Moses before the burning bush, I think it was about excuse number four when Moses said, God, I'm not, uh, I'm not a speaker. What if I get tongue-tied or whatever? But the defense, the reason I wanted Danny to read that this evening is to compare it with this this evening. What a leader Moses had become. How much courage did it take for him to stand up before God again? Because God was ready to take some big-time action. The points that he made were, were clear and precise. And for somebody who did not think their self in the beginning to be a leader, he shows how much he loves and loved the very people who were trying just moments before to stone him. And he says, God, and I'll just do this briefly. God, you make yourself appear weak to all the nations who've heard about what happened in Egypt. You make yourself appear weak if, if these people don't reach 
the promised land. And he said, number two, God, you, you remember you made a covenant with, with Abraham. And number three, God, you remember when, when we were on the, on the mountain and I had come back up and we were making that second set of stones? That you told me that you were a holy God who must punish, but because of your graciousness and your mercifulness, you must forgive. Remember that, Lord? In verse 24, God answers, and the first thing that he says is, Caleb was a good servant. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now the people responded with great mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning. And they get up early the next morning declaring they are ready to take the promised land. We will go up now. Moses tells the people that they are sinning again. This is faithlessness also because they are merely responding to the consequences rather than responding in the faith they should have had the first time. This is a characteristic of false repentance, declaring sorrow after the consequences have been revealed. Moses further tells the people that the Lord's not with them and they will not succeed. And in verse 43, we see, because you have turned back from following the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But the people presumed to go up even though Moses nor the Lord was with them. And they were soundly defeated. Failure. In conclusion this evening, we've noted that the book of Numbers is directly relevant to our lives. The Old Testament, as I said earlier, is, some, is a book that we can learn so much about ourselves in. And it's so much that we can learn about how God expects us to be people who seek His will. We're on a journey being led by the glory of the Lord just as they were. The glory we are after is one found in His Son and our Savior Jesus. There are many difficulties on our journey. Sometimes we make the wrong decisions. Sometimes we'll stumble. Sometimes we may make little blunders. But we need to seek God's will in all we do. In the, I guess, probably mid-50s, uh, probably late when I, in the 50s, when I, before I saw it, but over on South Kentucky, there was a restaurant that opened with two golden arches. Ray, Ray Clock, is that his name? No. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, started it. And it became a huge success. People like to eat greasy stuff. And others saw that. Hamburger chains were cropping up all over the place. None of them were really taking off like McDonald's, but one of them came up with a jingle. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it 
your way. We like things our way far too much. On our journey, we who believe so much in God and want to spend eternity with Him must seek His will in our life and have a faith that will help us get to heaven. A childlike faith. Ran across this article. It's by a gentleman by the name of Bob Goff. And as far as I know, Bob Goff is not a preacher. But in his writing, he, he made this point that I thought was so relevant for us in our time today. When some of Jesus' friends were arguing about who would be the greatest when they got to heaven, and this is from, I believe, Matthew chapter 18, Jesus told them unless they changed and became like children, they would never enter the kingdom of God. I think what he was saying is we need a childlike faith to understand him. What makes a lot of sense to me is not acting childish. That will... It's not acting childish that will get us to heaven. Plenty of people do that. It won't be our big prayers, our fancy language that will help us get there either. Big faith doesn't need big words. We also don't need to make faith easier because it's not. We need to make it simpler because it really is. Children have mastered what most of us are just beginners at. One of the thing about, things about kids, in addition to their simple faith, is that they aren't afraid of things many of us are afraid of. Their curiosity about what they don't know out distances, their fears about what they do know by a mile. Three words stand out to me in the Bible. They aren't big, deep theological words, yet that's probably what makes them big and deep and theological in nature. Here they are. Be not afraid. God whispered, be not afraid to Joshua when he didn't think he was the right guy to take over for Moses. He shouted those same words to Abram before the big battle when he said he'd be the shield and great reward. And Jesus said these words confidently to a boat full of scared fishermen when he walked out to them on the water. Be not afraid. These words have exactly as much power as we give them in our life. People who are becoming love experience the same uncertainties we all do. They just don't let fear call the shots. If we take to heart Jesus' words about having a childlike faith and not being afraid, they can move us from merely wishing things would get better for us. I'm sorry. They move us from... Whoops, I uh, went to the next line. Let me start that paragraph over. If we take to heart Jesus' words about having a childlike faith and not being afraid... They can move us from merely wishing things would get better for us to bearing up under the circumstances God actually gives us. They let us move from running away and hiding from our problems to engaging and embracing them. We are truly living in a difficult time in our history, one that we probably never knew that we would endure. May God bless us as we strive to make doing His will the most important thing in our lives. There's a way that seems right unto man, but its way leads to death. Thank you.